All right. Thanks, everybody, uh, for sticking with us. Welcome back uh, for that short break. So, whenever I get started on a, a, a series of short talks discussing the translational pathway for medical products. So, Neil, if you are ready, uh, you can go ahead. All right. Neil, can you hear us okay? There you go. Yes, I think I can. Um, oh, hold on one second. I'm having a little technical difficulty here. No worries. Right now we just we see the PowerPoint screen. Okay. Um, Neil, if you can get it in presentation mode, I think you're good to go. Yeah. I'm having trouble getting it there. Oh, no uh, problem. And, and Neil, I've got the slides too. Just let me know if you want me to run those. All right. Uh, you may have to do that because um, I can't seem to control it. Okay, let me... Why don't you do that and can you see that okay? Yep, that's good. Thank you so much. All right. I'll just tell you when to go to the next slide. So I, I am really pleased to be able to talk to you about some of the thoughts uh, in getting uh, technology from academic discovery to regulatory review. And I thought Dr. Shuren did a, an outstanding job of talking about the agency's commitment to that. A lot of it, it, it uh, of that responsibility is on the part of academic uh, industry and, and the clinicians involved in tra tra treating patients. So let's go to the next slide. The, the, the goal, um, is and it's also the challenge is to start uh, with a breakthrough idea from some inventor's mind or research lab and then translate that idea to a product that actually reaches patients there are three components that we've identified that are absolutely critical to that translational effort and it involves the people the processes and the product selection so there's a tremendous amount of effort that's required. Um, and so the people, the processes and the product are all critical if the, to make sure that the translational process is effective. It uses a tremendous amount of experience. As Dr. Shern mentioned, it takes a lot of examples of perhaps path failures to identify those things that actually work. So these are below our icons of a number of the different components that, that um, we often contribute to someone translating an idea to a product that meets patients. Next slide. One of the biggest challenges that drives uh, whether or not a product succeeds through the translational process is this is on this slide. Um, the reality is that with regard to medical devices, the cost of development continues to rise. And there are three factors in that. The, there's a growing regulatory burden. The number of tests, experiments, um, trials that are required to get through the regulatory process are increasing. As we contribute uh, money, dollars, capital, uh, from any source, grant funding or uh, venture capital or strategics uh, to projects that don't turn out to be successful. Maybe it's a, a poor idea. 
as we put money into those ideas, we have less money to put into the good ideas. And thirdly, um, if we have inefficient management efforts in that we might put money into solving problems that really don't need to be solved at an early stage, maybe it's something that could be solved a little later. Um, as we put money into those efforts that are just inefficient, um, that dries up the cost overall as well. Along with rising cost, the limited healthcare budget puts a lot of pressure on price and we see price decreases, you know, 2%, 5%, 10% in a year on products that, that are, are in the marketplace. So those two uh, factors, increasing cost and decreasing price, result in a decreased margin for innovation. So what basically happens is good ideas don't survive that squeeze because there isn't enough capital. So what we really need to focus on as an ecosystem is to focus our funding on viable ideas and then accelerate the development. Next slide, please. One of the areas in terms of regulatory burden, and we talked about it earlier, the, the MDR that's being put in place in Europe is extremely burdensome. Today, there are many pressures on sterilization methods. Um, there's a, a, an ecological problem that, that's perceived and uh, there's a lot of uh, work going into finding sterilization methods or valid, validate, validating those methods uh, that is causing turmoil in our development processes. Likewise, biocompatibility and the, the emerging requirements for biological evaluation plans for various materials has also driven um, a, a lot of extra effort in the translational area. Privacy regulations have made, made it uh, necessary for us to put a lot of controls in place on how we manipulate data, uh, transferring data from one country to another is problematic. Um, the, the last point I wanted to make is the disseminate or the decimation of products for small patient populations, such as pediatric and rare diseases. Um, it has, it has resulted in, um, a tremendous pressure on those types of innovations that might meet those small patient populations. Next slide. So let's talk about the three big areas that we've learned from experience, people, process, and product. And the people um, really need to include, as uh, Dr. Shuren had mentioned, uh, uh, stakeholders from various areas involved in the ecosystem. Uh, management, development teams that understand that ecosystem for medical devices and also have the ability and experience to communicate across stakeholders, uh, providing leadership and capital resources where they need to be, uh, avoiding putting money into things that aren't necessary um, and so that we have enough capital left over to do those things that will be critical. Processes for development, uh, Jeff mentioned uh, the Stanford process for uh, developing biomedical um, devices. And um, one way or another, we need a validated, accelerated product development process that eliminates the wasted effort from inexperience and mistakes. Finally, uh, there are a lot of great product ideas, but that pr great product idea might not be the best product idea to meet an unmet medical need. And so two things are critical that we look at various ways of addressing a particular medical need to pick the best way to do it. And we also pick um, something that's economically feasible given the regulatory burden and the market potential. Next slide, please. So there's a focus required on, uh, on, on how to develop a device. There's also communication so the company management really needs to understand the global aspects of product development, assemble that skilled development team, which generally needs to include not only the academic folks who understand the science, but also financial folks and 
uh, clinicians that might use it, uh, supply chain folks, all those things that are necessary uh, to, to guide the development. There needs to be a generation of capital from um, the company management team. And finally, participating in building bridges across all those stakeholders. Some great examples uh, that have already been talked about. Of course, the, this organization itself, ISCTSI, um, has provided a lot of that translational effort. There's an international organization um, that FDA has supported and, and we have been involved in International Society for Cardiovascular Translational Research that have provided some of that um, educational material of how you do translational work. Uh, harmonization by doing is an example of organization connecting um, requirements or processes in the US with those in Japan. And then finally, uh, international standards organizations all, always contribute to um, getting a living level playing field by identifying what the requirements might be for meeting a certain standard. Next slide, please. So there are all kinds of components in an accelerated product development sequence. And this is a graph just of, of a number of those components that have helped us accelerate um, products uh, to the marketplace. And the goal is to carefully coordinate and identify efficiencies, avoid pitfalls, all to accelerate the development by keeping it organized and doing the first things first, second things second, maximizing the parallel development processes to achieve the most time efficient uh, project plan. Next slide, please. So part of that process that we're most familiar with is a lot of engineering work and testing put into the product to make uh, it, it possible. Now this isn't the, the total picture, uh, but bench testing and developing models or doing phantom testing, simulation on computer systems, dealing with design control requirements to get the product into the, through the agency, MRI safety and animal studies, are all part of that process of, to get efficient development. Next slide, please. In addition to the, the engineering, the testing laboratories are the regulatory or the clinical science folks that would develop the regulatory pathway. Uh, and, and that regulatory pathway may go back and tell us what needed to be done in terms of testing, uh, in terms of of developing safety data that patients would need to feel comfortable being in a clinical trial. So, you know, these clinical science um, inputs are really critical upfront early in the development process. Next slide, please. So we, let's talk about then patient select or product selection. Um, it's about the finding the best idea for meeting a patient need and let me just say that oftentimes we start with a technology that we are enamored with and we wanna find out how we can mold the need to best match with the technology we have. But I would say that, that, that it's a great time to take a pause. Yes, we have a brand new technology we're so excited about, but let's look at the patient need and let's do the research that we know we need to do looking at all of the possible ways to meet that need before we take our great idea and just try to make it fit the, the patient need. Several people have avoided disasters in development and translation by doing that process. It, it requires that we evaluate scientifically feasible technologies of all kinds, that we look for reasonable intellectual property arrangements, that we, we develop clear, predictable, least burdensome regulatory pathway, and that we, um, we understand reasonable expenses to get the product from an idea stage to patient. Next slide, please. So I've talked in summary um, about three key elements in getting from an, an idea from, a, from just an idea or a product from an idea to a patient including people, process, and product. There are several different um, elements that are critical uh, to master. Let me share now next in the next slide with you an example that is quite familiar to many people 
um, in this uh, audience. Next slide, please. So this is one example of truly a technology that was developed and discovered at Purdue University. It was a while ago, uh, 1987. Next slide, please. This technology involved taking the intestine from pigs and identifying the submucosa, which is the, the center layer, if you will, of that, and then processing that in a unique way developed with by Purdue into a sheet material that could be used as a medical substrate. Next slide, please. Out of that um, discovery uh, and development of the technology, there was a company formed as a startup. Uh, two of the graduate students from Purdue were hired to run that company and, and drive that uh, the development into uh, uh, actual products for patients. And the first submission went in in 1997. Next slide, please. So out of that basic technology, through the regulatory process, there were numerous products. And you can see this diagram um, on the right-hand side, labeling all of the different components of the body where this material has ended up to be a critical product. And on the left side, a couple examples of the um, different products and showing that it's not all the same construct, but various forms of the same material. Next slide, please. So one of the goals of all of the translational efforts is to impact patients. And in this product line uh, from Purdue Technology through the Cook R&D and manufacturing plan, has, has now provided over 6 million products distributed globally. So there are 51 indications, it's over 20 years of clinical use and it's the product is being used in 88 countries. Next slide, please. So I just wanted to thank you for your time here. We talked about the importance of people, process and product selection in making that translational uh, process work from an idea to the bedside. Thank you very much. I appreciate your attention. No, thanks, Neil. That was great. Uh, lots of good information, I say, especially for those who are getting started on, uh, with a product of their own. So we've got the panel discussion coming up uh, after these talks, and we'll save the comments and questions until then. So if we want to move on to the next one, I'd like to introduce Dr. Andy Farb. Uh, Andy's the Chief Medical Officer in the Office of Cardiovascular Devices at FDA. He's going to talk about the FDA Early Feasibility Program. Um, Andy, go ahead. Uh, uh, thanks, Aaron. Can you see my slides? Yep, looks good. Great. Um, you know, thanks for the invite, and thanks to the organizers of the CTSI to participate in the retreat. It's uh, great to follow Neil, who I have known for many years, and also good to follow uh, Jeff Schur, who teed up uh, some of the concepts that I'll go into a little bit more detail uh, during this uh, brief presentation. So there's only so much one can get from doing uh, bench and animal studies for a new device or an approved device for a new indication. And so you need to get into eventually into a human being to test the device. And so there, that's the opportunity for a first in man or an early feasibility study. And those studies are designed to obtain uh, initial insights into uh, proof of concept, uh, whether the device performs as intended, some basic safety information, human factors, helping to define the patient population where the device must may be most uh, useful. And this early clinical experience provides the basis uh, for further device iteration and product improvement, and is integral to the uh, device development process. So I think what Jeff uh, alluded to, and it was clear that we had a problem in the United States, and that was that the uh, development and the testing of, of innovative, uh, potentially beneficial, beneficial devices was getting bogged down here. And what we were seeing was an, an outmigration of an initial clinical testing of novel devices overseas and a growing time lag to uh, access uh, beneficial medical devices. And, you heard about the, the uh, transcatheter aortic valve experience where uh, uh, the um, US was far behind the rest of the world. And with that, uh, you know, the price uh, in, uh, in addition to patients not having access was a delay in phys physician experience with the new products. 
And the first thing we and FDA had to do was look inwardly to, to understand that our non-clinical uh, data requirements were contributing uh, to the problem and, and really think in new ways about how we can uh, change the culture and the way we were doing business. So because we have a, a broad audience here, I just wanted to give a brief one slide on FDA 101 about uh, investigational device exemptions or IDEs. And IDEs approval is issued by us to allow the use of a significant risk investigational device in humans. Uh, the IDE uh, regs provide protection to human subjects through informed consent, requires study monitoring and reporting and allows the shipping of devices. And often the clinical study data collected under an IDE can be used to support a marketing application uh, for the device uh, uh, following FDA review. So the first step uh, was to come up with a guidance to think uh, about how we can uh, put forward a set of um, uh, uh, where, uh, background information and a set of new approaches uh, to try to reinvigorate uh, uh, the testing of novel and uh, early stage devices in the United States. So the, the, the guidance was uh, issued in 2013 and the key objectives of this work were to increase U.S. patient access to potentially beneficial medical devices and increase U.S. participation in, in these uh, in these studies and, and also just change the culture. We wanted to enhance the collaboration amongst the, all the stakeholders, including the developers, the industry, us as regulators and the investigators, and then use the IDE regulations uh, to protect us uh, study our participants. So first we had to come up, next we had to come up with a definition of an early feasibility study. So this is a, a study involving a small number of initial subjects for a device that may be early in development and often before the, the final device design has been set to be used in a, in a larger study. Importantly, an early feasibility study does not necessarily involve the first clinical use of the device. It could be uh, the device could have been used elsewhere, for example, overseas and then brought to the United States. But it, the, the key thing is that the development uh, uh, of that device has reached a stage where a further device uh, evaluation cannot be practically obtained with additional non-clinical assessments or non-clinical testing is unavailable such that it needed to be tested in, um, in a human being um, once we had uh, 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 adequate information that it was likely to be safe. The key principle for the, in the guidance was that we could approve an, an IDE based on less non-clinical data than, than, than it would have been needed to support a larger clinical study of a finalized device design. And this really involved this idea about a cultural change such that we could have new ways for us as regulators and the study sponsors and the investigators to work together to justify and support transition that transition from bench to bedside so that we would increasingly focus not just on the device and all the battery of testing that would be required before use in, in use in a human, but what's the underlying clinical condition? What are the, what's, what other alternative treatments are available and what is the safety and effectiveness associated with those alternative treatments? And then incorporate in the study investigational plan, risk mitigation strategies and enhanced monitoring along with a tailored consent to enhance uh, patient safety. So why was it okay to um, require less upfront non-clinical testing? And here we embraced a uh, concept from manufacturing uh, of just-in-time testing, which essentially um, is doing a, a right and appropriate test at the right time so that it may be acceptable to defer some non-clinical testing until the device design has been finalized for use in a pivotal trial in more patients. Understanding that comprehensive testing in early phases of the device development may add a, a good deal of cost without much in the way of value. So because some tests may have limited applicability if the, if the device is modified, and I'll talk about that in the, in the next slider, uh, slide, or that conducting non-informative testing delays device access to patients who may have limited alternatives. So again, bringing back the under, understanding of the underlying clinical condition and addressing uh, unmet needs. 
so that to do this, we embrace the idea that uh, sponsors could uh, leverage more data and information to support uh, a the device uh, being uh, acceptably uh, safe uh, to start a clinical investigation. So we know that devices are not drugs and, and, so, and that devices are continually modified as experiences gained through their use. And one of the holdups that we recognized in, the, in device development in the United States was that we didn't have good ways to uh, facilitate the review and approval of potentially beneficial device modification or procedure modifications during the actual study. So we incorporated some new tools to facilitate the review teams working with the sponsors to bring these these changes forward and get them into the um, the clinical um, uh, into the, the clinical environment more quickly through five day notifications, something we call continued continued approval. In, in other words, granting approval up front and having the sponsors provide the data uh, uh, later to meet uh, acceptance uh, standards and then being much more interactive than we have been on traditional uh, uh, EF, uh, traditional IDEs. And then we saw the great value of stakeholder interaction with the EFS program in contrast to the old way where testing would be done in Europe or in, in Asia, and it would reach the US and the US regulators well along in the uh, device development and use process. And we would have to come up to speed of a train that already had been in motion by bringing the uh, regulators on board early on, <clears throat> we would get experience with the device through its development and change. And then importantly, reach consensus with the sponsors about what data requirements are needed to go from first to human to a larger feasibility study effort. Uh, and then and then hopefully to a pivotal trial to us to collect the definitive data for safety and effectiveness, which would lead to FDA approval. And by this method of having the regulators on board right from the beginning, there'd be smoother transitions to these types of studies. So it's been gratifying that this the program has been uh, successful over the last uh, seven years that it's been in place. We've seen more than doubling of the IDEs submitted to us and over uh, 200 uh, EFS IDs have been approved, uh, in, encompassing over 2,500 patients enrolled in the cumulative studies. And we, these, the review staff has gotten uh, uh, good in terms of their ability to review these things and th these are submissions in a timely fashion, so that we've uh, able to uh, get an approval decision of about eight and 10 EFS IDs during the first review cycle. And the program is fairly widely distributed across the, the, the center um, with the highest utilization in cardiovascular and neurological, neurologic devices. So um, this, we look at the EFS as a foundational program. And the question that often comes up is, you know, what's next? You've done your early feasibility study or you have one ongoing. Uh, what are the potential next steps? Well, one is, um, you know, the whole, one of the basic principles of the EFS program is learn as you go. You, uh, you figure out what works, what doesn't work, what, what potential modifications may be needed in the device or the procedure, and you make changes after you have gained experience, for example, in the first five to 10 patients, and then you uh, ask for additional patients to test a modification of the device. Or, um, you could expand the EFS to get more experience, go from 10 patients to 50 patients, bringing new sites on and investigators on board to gain further clinical experience, and then to refine the safety and effectiveness of event rate estimates, which will be useful in uh, pivotal trial planning. But we have seen uh, some very successful EFS uh, programs evolve um, and, uh, and work very well right out of the box such that a transition can be made directly from the an EFS uh, to a pivotal trial without going through intermediate steps. What we've done to try to maintain the growth of the program is uh, to try to address within FDA those cross-cutting non-clinical test requirements uh, such as uh, sterility, animal studies, biocompatibility, 
uh, that are common to many of the device areas uh, so that we can have more consistency and a more efficient review. And then proactively expand the program across uh, the other device areas by identifying disease and device areas in which EFS to date have been customarily conducted overseas. And to do that, that involves direct outreach to sponsors and developments, developers, and a list active participation of uh, clinical research leaders. Um, we go to many professional society meetings to promote the EFS program. And then we've also uh, more recently engaged uh, directly with patient advocacy groups and device trade organizations. We also learned that uh, making uh, reforms uh, within FDA is not sufficient because there's a whole world out there that is necessary uh, to, to build an successful US EF, EFS program. And uh, Dr. Shorin alluded to that uh, and alluded to the uh, Medical Device Innovation Consortium, which brings together uh, various uh, stakeholders, including other government partners the device industry and nonprofits of all those uh, uh, groups that have interests in, uh, in healthcare and beneficial treatments, uh, getting to patients as quickly as possible. And then recognizing all the other steps in the chain that, are, that go beyond FDA, but are required to get these uh, products evaluated um, uh, and then uh, assemble those data for FDA review and uh, hopeful approval. So FDA has supported the MDIC EFS initiatives and the group within MD MDIC that is dedicated uh, to the to e early feasibility studies. Uh, there is an ongoing cardiovascular uh, pilot um, and a neurovascular pilot in development. And the goal is to further expand these uh, consortia in different device areas. Uh, I said uh, we at FDA so, uh, have been uh, uh, partners in this, uh, offering uh, guidance uh, on the EFS uh, on EFS principles, and then partnering with MDIC in the development of tools uh, to help with uh, contracting, language libraries, outreach to patient advocacy groups, and, and help with informed consent um, and EFS information to patients and investigators and sites and then uh, providing input on EFS met metrics uh, and data collection forms to assess the success of the program. And then we uh, promote the EFS site consortium to prospective sponsors to get them involved and then participate in various MDIC workshops. So there are over, in, within the cardiovascular site consortium, there are over 30 uh, sites that are participating and we've outlined uh, some goals uh, to try to get these programs up and running at the sites. And that's the 60-60-60 approach uh, where we like to have FDA and IRB approval completed within 60 days, contract execution within 60 days, and first subject enroll within the next 60 days. Um, we need to assess the success of this program. So we're tracking metrics and testing these tools as well as uh, the goal is to launch uh, future networks. Uh, there are uh, multiple industry partners that are also uh, supporting the consortium. And we have seen some uh, improvements in the timelines, uh, understanding that in the device world, uh, time is a, an extremely valuable resource. So we've seen uh, uh, reduced time to IDE approval, IRB approval, uh, reaching the 60 day milestone, improvement in site and subject in enrollment, but we still have challenges in contracting and budgeting. Um, in the last uh, couple of slides, I uh, want to come back to the uh, something that uh, Dr. Schoen brought up about the Breakthrough Devices Program, uh, which is intended to help uh, expedite uh, the evaluation and approval of, of effect, more effective treatments to address unmet needs. And here, there has been a logarithmic increase in the number of uh, uh, Breakthrough Device uh, submissions uh, to FDA and really striking even in, it, particularly in my area, cardiovascular devices, where uh, there's been a, a over sevenfold increase in two years in the number of breakthrough device designations and uh, that have come uh, to our office. Now, it's natural for the EFS program to work synergistically with the uh, breakthrough devices program, such that 
that EFS uh, IDE can uh, support a breakthrough device designation uh, application and so uh, increase the chances of that device uh, earning the breakthrough device designation from FDA reviewers or work in the other direction where a breakthrough device has received the, the, the designation and the EFS is the most efficient way uh, for that device to be um, uh, initially evaluated. So the priority should be uh, to get ID approval and the first patient enrolled and treated and a breakthrough designation can be submitted prior to concurrent with or even after the IDE has been approved and is up and running. So looking ahead uh, for us in the EFS program, we'd like to increase EFS utilization across CDRH, facilitate the transition from EFS to pivotal trials, interact with CMS colleagues on EFS coverage decision-making, continue to advance EFS synergies with the Breakthrough Devices Program, support the EF, MDIC EFS site consortium, and enhance collaboration with, this, with stakeholders for sustainable EFS growth in this year and beyond. So uh, thank you very much uh, for the chance to talk to the group. Um, look forward to uh, discussion. Thank you, Aaron. Awesome, thanks, Andy. That was a great introduction to not just early feasibility, but time to break through into it as well. Uh, I mean, both programs, I hope we can continue to take more advantage of for, for innovative devices. So our final presentation is uh, from Rob Lyles. Rob's president of uh, Cook Regen Tech, and he'll give us a vision and some thoughts around uh, what the future of medical device development looks like across Indiana and the Midwest region. Uh, Rob, if you are ready, please go ahead. I will, and uh, no no PowerPoints, just gonna uh, run through some thoughts and, and talk a little bit about where we are as an ecosystem and where we are as Indiana. Uh, you know, the, the future trends and where we want to go and the importance of academic partnerships um, is vital. And if you'll go with me here for 10 minutes, let's let's talk about partnership maybe from a little different angle. Um, we traditionally think of partnership, and I think Neil gave an you know, incredible example of partnership, uh, you know, deep research relationships with universities, uh, certainly in, in the case of my, my parent company, Cook, uh, you know, an incredible relationship with Purdue up, up in uh, Lafayette, all the uh, West Lafayette all these years, uh, has spawned all sorts of things, great products, uh, talent that's come to the company, um, you know, discoveries and research that maybe got used in different ways that didn't embody in a product, um, wonderful partnership. But for a few minutes, let's talk about partnership, maybe in a little different way, which is, if you'll go with me, let's use the surrogate of company creation, especially university-based startup or university-derived startups as sort of a surrogate for how we're doing in our partnership. And the reason that that's an interesting way to look at it is a company and it sort of embodies something very specific. It, in, it embodies a dedication and a focus. Uh, people leave what they're doing. They, they, you know, they create this thing to focus solely on that thing. Uh, it also embodies, which is important to us on the industry, on the bigger industrial side, a very deliberate de-risking process. There's a, there's a risk assessment that starts with, you know, do we have IP on this thing? Is there an addressable market? Then you go into very active de-risking and you heard a lot of that this morning touched on. Uh, certainly regulatory de-risking in our space is massive, uh, really critical. Um, you know, de-risking product fit, market fit, all of those kinds of activities that can happen in, in that smaller environment, very, very critical. Um, nationally, uh, medical device startups are in a tough spot right now. It's hard to get investment for uh, Neil pointed to the sort of that squeeze that he showed in, in that uh, slide. That squeeze affects the investment community. That squeeze of regulatory risk, regulatory uncertainty and commercial uncertainty uh, makes it hard for these companies to get across this, what they call the valley of death. You know, you have the initial uh, in, uh, invention, the, the initial discovery, uh, you're starting to embody it. Uh, it's moving sort of from a technology to an actual product and then getting across that great divide to where it can finally reach a market, finally impact a patient is, is a big chasm. So I wanna do this in a, in a couple of ways. One, let's just take a quick flyover of the state of Indiana, kind of look down from way on high and look down on it and say, what's happening? Where, where's the money going? Where, where are companies coming from? And then secondary, let's talk about the ecosystem because there's a few new entrants into the ecosystem that I think could play very favorably into sort of this destiny. And what I want you to think about is with all that we have in this state, my daydream uh, is we should be starting a new device company every 30 days. We ought to be have a rich and robust ecosystem that can do that. Now, the reality is 
we're not doing that. We don't start device companies every 30 days. We haven't done that in a while, as a matter of fact. So as we do this flyover, we start with the flyover and say, where is device development really happening? And this would be with you know, IP disclosures, um, you know, regulatory filings, you know, market impact, how, th those kinds of things, maybe funding, you could use that if it's sort of a, in the startup uh, idea. Well, the first one is the obvious one. If you fly over the state and look down from on high, Bloomington, Warsaw, Indianapolis, you've got the orthopedics up in Warsaw and that, and that cluster of companies, big strategics, you've got Indianapolis, Roche, uh, Lilly has a device group. Uh, and then of course, Bloomington, again, our parent company, uh, West Lafayette would also fit that under the cook umbrella, uh, Bloomington, West Lafayette. Um, those are all, that's all strategic activity though. That's all big established multi-decades old companies doing that. The next hot spots that you would find are actually not university associated or university derived, they're independents. Um, if you look at VC data for the state, we talk a lot about life science VC and you'll see that on some of the internal state publications of, you know, here's the 2020 roundup. We raised about 20% 20, uh, 20 more for life science companies last year than um, the year before. And we, we talk about life science statistics a lot. And that's, that's exciting because MedTech's part of that. Um, what we don't often talk about is that represents almost no activity on the device level. That's almost all small molecule and drug. Uh, because of, of Lilly and some of the other great companies that are here and part of the life science ecosystem, that dominates what is going on, not only on a VC fundraise, but also when you look at tech transfer out of universities and our great institutions, uh, you know, Purdue, IU, Notre Dame, a lot of the tech transfer in the life science space is not med, med device, it's actually small molecule. So within that, you look at some of, some of the, uh, what has gone on, there, there are independents outside of that that are medical device. They've actually had some success raising, um, but they're independent. They're, it's not university derived um, uh, IP. I pulled some of the list just to give you, and I'll drop some of these names. If you're interested in any of these, I'll, I'll make sure that Aaron has all of these and we can follow up. Uh, but the top three in the state of Indiana, 2020, Wishbone Medical, which is a pediatric ortho to some of the pediatric discussion we were having today. It's out of Warsaw, they got a $20 million raise. That was the, that was the highest. That's not Indiana money though portion of its Indiana money, a lot of it's coming from outside of the state to fund um, ideas like that, obviously aligned with the strategics in Warsaw. Uh, Innovative Health Solutions, which is a neurostimulator play, um, that's independent physician, Indianapolis and Seymour based, a $10.5 million raise last year. And then Nanavis, which is a spinal implant, that's out of Columbia City, uh, they did about a $2 million raise. So the biggest are the strategics when you fly over the state. The next hot spots you see are actually independents that really aren't part of this kind of CTI, CTSI type ecosystem we're talking about today. When you get to the university derived, there are some, uh, but they are relatively smaller and relatively fewer. So I did find three that are sort of being talked about here in the last 12, 18 months around the state. Compact Medical, which is an intubation bag alternate, alternate for the critical care setting. IU School of Medicine Discovery, it's got a 510K filed on it. Uh, so that's in process. Uh, one from Purdue Reflex, uh, which was formerly Bright Lamp. Um, that's that really cool concussion uh, diagnostic technology that's been worked on at Purdue. That got money from Elevate and from the Black and Gold Fund, so it did get some of the internal state money applied to that one. And then Blair Medical, which is a device and diagnostic play um, out of Trine University up in Angola. Uh, again, they, they're on a 510K path for, for their dominant product. Um, so those are some that are at least associated with universities. Um, but when you think about the ecosystem that we've built, um, we ought to be doing a whole lot better than that. The ecosystem in Indiana uh, is truly special. Uh, when you look at what the academic assets represent and all of our three major institutions um, between Purdue, uh, IU and Notre Dame, all have, have really cast some vision and done some amazing things to put in the infrastructure to develop startups and to, de and to take student ideas, faculty ideas and develop and evolve those uh, into innovation that can actually reach the market. Uh, one of the things I love, they say up at, at Purdue Research Foundation, um, I, I can't forget if, I think maybe attributed to, to President Daniels, I can't remember, but basically it's not innovation until, you know, it's actually uh, it's valuable to somebody until it's actually helping someone. Um, and that, that, that's a key. When you think about all of the money and resource that's been put into and the vision that's been put into uh, those assets, the Purdue Research Foundation, 
um, the foundry. So there's, 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 there's venture capital available there. There's programming to help startups work through and figure out their idea. There's a real estate play. So if you, you know, you need a place to build a building, um, there are uh, common areas and gathering spaces. Um, IU has a, a similar infrastructure that they have set up through innovation and commercialization office. And up at Notre Dame, uh, it's the idea center. All of those uh, rich, rich programming uh, that if you're not aware of what's available at your institution, or if you're on the industry side, maybe you're really dialed in with one institution, but haven't checked out the others, I would highly encourage you to do so. There is this incredible ecosystem. Now, having said that, uh, George said at the outset, we're not going to rest on our laurels. So let me be provocative once again, and this isn't to, to call out. It's just simply to say, where are we really? Are we really where we want to be? I pulled up the stats just from the last uh, 20 or the last year or so. Uh, so Purdue, which I think truly has one of the best in class in the country, uh, ecosystem plays there on campus uh, with Purdue Research Foundation. It's incredible. Um, their fiscal year IP licensed startups of Purdue. I looked them up. There were 22 listed on the website. Um, only two were either diagnostic or possibly device. Two of 22. Um, for their uh, 2020 year staff and student owned startups, they had 33 new startups listed. Great to have 33 zero of them were device, zero. Um, Notre Dame, uh, their list on their site from the center, uh, 24 companies listed, zero were medical device. So the richness of this ecosystem, and, and then IU as well, um, they uh, their IU Venture Fund uh, has been given some presentations. When you look at the cast of companies that they've been investing in, fantastic companies, a lot of them in the biopharma space and or small molecule space, no devices, in fact, no diagnostics there as well. And of the seven startups that have uh, specifically been started from their uh, innovation commercialization center, none of the seven are device as well. So that's not to call out, that is to say, we're not resting on our laurels. What are we gonna do with all this incredible infrastructure that we've got here in the state? Because it really is incredible. And a couple of new entrants I wanted to mention and I'll try to sort of bring this in for a landing. Um, one of the things that has come online in the ecosystem it's been coming for a couple of years, but it really started to crystallize in 2020. The first is additional placemaking outside of the universities. Uh, so placemaking for innovation, innovation communities. Uh, 16 Tech is one that we've been involved with as Cook uh, down in Indianapolis. It's a you know, work, live, play space. There's a lot of infrastructure and a lot of programming there. Uh, IU School of Medicine and IU are very involved in that. So that's becoming part of their orbit right across the street from, from the, uh, the medical school. Uh, really neat programming. There's a maker space. Uh, there's all sorts of assets there that are being brought a group called 1776, which runs uh, incubate, incubators all over the country uh, is doing the programming there. So a lot of really neat things are going to be happening, I think, at 16 Tech. Uh, down in Bloomington, there's the Dimension Mill, uh, which again is a, a startup environment where uh, founders and creators can come, uh, have office space, get mentorship, do, do those kinds of things. Um, 16 Tech, let me go back there for a moment. One of the other additional pieces that's been added to the ecosystem, and when you think about a vision of how do we create more startups, how do we create, uh, you know, activate and truly translate, CTSI is all about translation, how do we truly translate uh, to market, to innovation that reaches patients ultimately? Um, some new entrants, which is this concept of uh, the startup studio, but more specifically the venture studio. And what's interesting about a venture studio model, and there's three new entrants that have come into the market. You've got Next Studio, uh, Boomerang Ventures, and High Alpha Innovations have all just come online uh, in the last eight to 10 months. Um, two of those are going to be housed at 16 Tech. Uh, High Alpha Innovations is, is housed at a different spot there in Indy. Um, but what those models do is it's an actual connection of they've already, and two of, two of the three, already have capital and they're investing along a thesis line. They're, they're going after specific things. They have very sophisticated systems for de-risking uh, and for understanding the pathway of a product to market. Uh, those are have been very successful in the outside uh, in other industries. Uh, and those have had a lot of success in speeding up time to market, in de-risking assets in a way that makes them more interesting and valuable to strategics. Uh, kind of really working at some of that grassroots level to, to vet ideas, to get some of the major risk points identified and mitigated so that by the time someone is sitting down, maybe trying to catch the attention of a strategic, it's a much better developed idea, a much better developed product, much better um, uh, pathway to, to market potentially. 
Um, so there's a lot going on in Indiana. The academic assets and the communities there are powerful and they are staffed with incredible people. There's money available, there's real estate, there's everything that someone would need to start moving down that path. Okay, Rob, all this stuff exists. Why aren't there more startups in medical device? Neil got at, I think, one of the keys, which is there is the squeeze. And because of the regulatory uncertainty and because of the commercial uncertainty, what that raises the bar on is we need to create and continue to invest in and pull together as a community, these learning communities that we've talked about, collaboration. We've got to pull together the right mixture to allow these ideas to be de-risked appropriately. Regulatory de-risking is critical in medical device. If you don't have the, the, the reg path, you don't have anything. Doesn't matter how cool it is or how great it is. I know I'm preaching to the choir on this, but I've been surprised in my journeys over the years and, and Cook, again, great partner of all these universities. And we've, as executives, we've all had projects and things that we've, we've worked very hard on. I'm always surprised a little bit at the relative naivete sometimes within the academic environment to the regulatory issues that come with medical device. A great idea without a good reg path is not going to help anyone. Beyond that, uh, the other things to touch on, and, and Jeff uh, Sheeran touched on some of this, de-risking from a payer perspective, de-risking, you know, health economics. Um, there is a commercial de-risking. How does it fit strategically in a market? Uh, what does the distribution potentially look like? Some of those are later stream questions that come. But all of that de-risking activity, we've got, we've got, the, the, we've got the, 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 the nucleus of what we need. We've got incredible systems. We just need to augment them a bit, bring the community together the right way. And again, my vision would be, and my hope would be that someday we're sitting together and we're starting a new startup every four weeks. Now that sounds, where'd I, where'd I get that, you know, where'd I get that, that idea? Um, that's being done in Indiana right now by other industry segments. The tech industry, again, they don't have the regulation we do. They're doing just high alpha innovations alone uh, has been starting a company every four weeks already since they started. Um, those kinds of, that kind of cadence and that kind of rhythm is possible over time. We've got a lot of work to do. My final thought for you as we think about how to bring this together and, and, and leverage what we've got to de-risk better is thinking about the problems that medical device needs to solve. We've got the great physical products and we, we talk medical device, people think about, you know, material science and engineering and, and all of those are very relevant to what we do. What's the next physical embodiment of the product? But as you heard today, real world evidence, data is a big deal. Um, we were on the phone the other day and, and, and us building the evidentiary basis that we need, you heard, you've heard reference to M, uh, MDR, the European regulations. It's up to the bar for us as the industry on what outcomes data we need to provide and what kind of surveillance we have to do once it gets to market. Those represent entrepreneurial opportunities as well. All of these universities that are represented here have major data plays, big time IT schools, uh, big time uh, engineering uh, relative to information and technology like that. That's critical to this. The, the, the problem sets that we def define, it's not just the devices, it's adding telemetry and, and um, sensors to some existing devices. It is, uh, we hasn't been touched on much today. I think it's in the afternoon. Um, software is a medical device, major new area for us in the medical device world. Thinking through that, how, to, how, to, how is that gonna be regulated? How are the guidances gonna be translated? We've got the tech assets in this state. We have incredible tech community, meaning just pure IT community. The opportunity to overlap that Venn diagram now with the healthcare community and with medical device specifically, that is a unique opportunity for Indiana. It really is a unique opportunity because we understand life science and healthcare very well. We understand IT and the tech side. That's something uh, also to think about. So I'll leave it at that. But the vision to me would be, we ought to be talking, to, you know, when we get together for meetings like this, we ought to be able to put up a roster and go look at all the new companies that got created in the last year. Um, to do that, we've got to bring the de-risking mentality. We've got to get more than just you know, scientists and a, and a business person together. We've got to bring in the regulatory teams. I was thrilled to hear Sharon's opening. Uh, I didn't know she was going there, but this think tank idea, and I was glad to see Aaron that you're gonna be on that think tank from the regulatory science side. I think that's exactly the kind of thing, very multidisciplinary collaborative type units that can help take cool ideas, but really get them shaped and formed in a way that they have the opportunity to make it to market. And, and I think there's a lot of, lot of ways to do that. So. With that, I think the future of Indiana development is very bright, 
uh, but we got to be realistic about where we are. We're not anywhere close to where we want to be. Let's work towards a world where we could be cranking a new company uh, about once a month and uh, and see uh, see what kind of innovation explosion we'd be able to enjoy from that. Thanks, Aaron. Awesome. Thanks, Rob. Uh, it's a great goal we can uh, we can aim for. And I mean, you hit on, on so many of the points and exactly why we're trying to bring everyone together today and, and build some of those connections that we can. Like I said, we, everything is here. It just needs that little push or that shove to get it, you know, to really get it moving and, and churning. Um, all right. So we've got about 10 minutes or so till we take a break for lunch. Um, I want to hand things over to the speakers. And I don't know if Dr. Kelly was able to join us yet. Um, Dr. Kelly is Deputy Director and Chief Scientist at CDRH. Uh, he joined FDA last year after a, a long career, uh, really starting financing, growing, exiting companies uh, across the life science sector. Uh, so at FDA, he inter interfaces with <clears throat> numerous external stakeholders uh, to help create a more vibrant and sustainable med tech ecosystem, to help bring new innovation in patients uh, more quickly, like we've been talking about. Um, so. Uh, Rob, Neil, Andy, uh, do any of you want to start off with some additional thoughts or I've got some comments too. Well, I think it, we've had a great session here talking about some of the challenges. Um, and I, I think what, what we could do is, is talk about how, um, CTSI, uh, would address those. Does it, do we have any ideas along that line, um, from any of our, our participants or um, any of the speakers? Well, people are coming up to the virtual microphone, uh, Neil. I think I just want to, I mean, we really enjoy these and welcome, you know, outreach and these kind of, uh, um, you know, organizations that uh, bridge the gaps between academics and the private sector and sponsors. So, you know, um, people should feel uh, open to address their questions to us um to help you know bring the you know these programs forward so um you know we it's a you know big organization but um you know uh, often just find finding the right person to answer your questions can, can really help uh jump start some of the issues that uh that develop yeah rob how do you think um ctsi could actually impact uh the goal you mentioned which is bringing more companies what do we have to do um well, i i think um Sharon's uh, proposal for the think tanks that outlined this morning uh, was was a, a very interesting one. Um, I think uh, I know it's just a, a first thought. Uh, obviously, it was of all the academic partners involved. Uh, so as immediately as I was scanning that list, of course, I was thinking, okay, how do we get industry into that conversation? Uh, and and um, I think for um, for CTSI, I know that at an end, I think continuing to to um, spread the word within um, the institutions is very critical. I know that um, many of my interactions and, and, and I spend a fair amount of time, especially in Indianapolis with, with the IU community, um, there is, there's such great ideas, but again, there isn't a lot of even practical understanding sometimes of the resources that are available within the institution. Um, there, there certainly is almost always an underappreciation of regulatory challenges and issues and pathways. Um, and so I think the more that we can work together and, and educate and inspire within the institutions where the great intellectual capital is and where all these incredible ideas might spur from, uh, connect them better with the problems that we're seeing out there in the clinical world, uh, listening very well, because sometimes academic medical centers, obviously we're listening to them as industry to hear what, what they're seeing in the patient setting. Um, so, so communication certainly, um, and and I think also, um, and Neil Neil knows this well. He and I both have had many adventures together in starting companies and trying different things. It, it's just it's an act of will to start some of these things. You just you just have to dive in and and grind through it and, and push it forward. And it's it's a very challenging journey. And so, I think for the for the academic settings, we need to set some goals, and and they're somewhat arbitrary. But you know, we're going to start a company, we're going to start X number of companies and that just forces them, well, you know, around what idea or how do we go through a process to find an idea and, and just as we do it, then we will do more of it. And, and again, there's great company creation infrastructure. We're just not creating around devices. There's something, when I was, I was scrolling through all these uh, companies that are being created at Purdue and other places, I mean, it's really cool stuff. I mean, agriculture and space and, and aeronautics and all this cool stuff. 
we just got to bring that focus and we need your help. I think even evangelizing, how do we do this around medical device more uh, would be, would be something for all the, the CTI, CTSI groups. So a little, little high level there, Neil, but yeah, I, I think it's about communication, I guess, and spreading the word a little more. So we've had a lot of, a, a lot of opportunities actually to help a physician that had an idea or an academic group or even a startup company uh, who has an idea, they have a target, they need to know how to put that whole plan together. We've had that privilege, mm -hmm. you know, so we can lay out the regulatory pathway. We can figure out what testing needs to be done, what the development path is. As Jeff mentioned, and I think Andy <sighs> mentioned also, some things don't need to be done right away, like doing your final biocompatibility testing before you have your final product doesn't make any sense. But uh, we've had a lot of people come to us with this very well-developed biocompatibility testing plan that they want to do right up front. And we say, whoa, wait a minute, don't waste your money because you're going to get the opportunity to do it again if you do, right? Um, so we've had that privilege of, of putting those plans together for people. One of our biggest challenges, I think, in the state is attracting funding. And you mentioned it, Rob. And, you know, I, I don't know if someone has a, a comment um, on how we could better engage um, funding mechanisms to get these companies with adequate capital to make it successful. Um, you know, I see Dr. Wadika on, on the, uh, on the uh, <laughs> conference. Maybe you have an idea, George, on, on how we can better connect with funding sources. I mean, obviously there's STTR, SBIR stuff, early stage, but but we have not done so great with the venture capital and, and corporate money. Any thoughts? Yeah, that's correct. I mean, I'm resonating uh, with some of Rob's uh, comments. I mean, over the last, I'd say half a dozen years, we've done much more direct licensing of technologies to medium and large size companies, just because it's been relatively daunting, right? Given your curve there with cost issues and regulatory challenges and other things, um, you know, to garner enough energy, if you will, and willpower uh, to go the startup route, right? Because it is so difficult. And of course, the, you know, the overall likelihood of success is relatively low. So we as a school have done more direct you know, to a bigger company licensing of technologies just to say, hey, you know, this is great stuff. In a sense, you know how to run with it. Now, that doesn't grow this ecosystem. I'm just making that, uh, that one comment. Also, we've been, uh, you know, launching companies all over the state, Rob. NanoV, who you mentioned, that's Purdue Biomedical Engineering Technology. It just happens to not be sitting in West Lafayette. So that's the other thing. We're trying to be less parochial. Uh, and to really place these companies in the places where they'll do the best because of the local community uh, infrastructure. You know, the challenge of bringing in venture capital, especially from out of state or all over the world uh, into the Midwest, no less Indiana, is always a challenge, right, Neil? And um, uh, I, I think we're doing better in terms of early stage funding from a lot of the seed programs that we have, like Rob mentioned the Foundry Investment Fund, he and I are both involved in that. Uh, and But that sort of, you know, that gets things up and going in a sense uh, and helps uh, in, the, in the very early stages. But, you know, the, the types of, you know, big, big amounts raised uh, that are needed in subsequent series uh, are, are always a challenge. And I think um, that's a, a national trend in the medical device space is, is that it's very difficult. Now, uh, you know, one, one of the uh, sessions this afternoon is on digital health and wearable devices and sort of newer realms, uh, you know, that we're all getting in in various ways. And, and I think that does beg a question. Uh, will there be VCs that traditionally have not been in our space? Uh, that will be interested in investing in it as, uh, you know, as uh, health monitoring, for lack of a better term, be becomes more a part of healthcare. So I think there are some things that are changing the dynamics. Um, so that's not a, an answer, Neil, but I think uh, so, some points in that regard. And, and Sharon, I saw you had uh, kind of a hand up there. Did you want to add some thoughts on, uh, on the funding or, or CTSI? 
Yeah, I, I was going to mention on the CTSI. So I think one of our challenges is going to be to get the clinicians to articulate ideas and needs at the bedside to us. Um, so they need to know that that they see, I mean, they're on the day-to-day -day hands on and they can say, see improvements and things, you know, things that can actually make a difference. They don't have any idea where to go. And that's one of our hopes is that we'll be able to advertise this think tank concept that they can do a handoff to people um, and then they will take it forward um, so that these ideas can actually move. I just think it's important. I mean, as a clinician, you know, you think of stuff all the time while you're rounding and seeing a patient and then you just go away because you're doing a whole bunch of other things. So that's just one other piece. I think we have to work hard on the CTSI. That mm -hmm. unmet clinical need has to be really key. And that's when you'll track funding, I think. The other, but, uh, even, but even Sharon, when you first mentioned your concept of the think tank to me, this gets back to Rob's comment. You were really thinking of, we want venture capitalists on this. We want yeah, uh, we business do. people on it. We want regulatory people. And what you saw in that list, Rob, is, is a tremendous effort by Sharon and Sarah and others literally over the last weeks, you know, to at least get our arms around a big academic, complex academic community that we have in Indiana as a first step. Um, but, uh, you know, to quickly then reach out. Uh, I think uh, you've just volunteered at least yourself uh, <laughs> to such an activity, uh, but, I, it, but it, it, it's, it will be absolutely critical for us to have representatives uh, not only uh, from incubators and, and sort of startup activities, but fr from the medium and large size companies that we have uh, in order to make this successful. I, I think we have the enthusiasm and the energy to do it, um, uh, but it's going to take all of our efforts. And, and then, and although we didn't delineate who on the list, the plan and both of the, uh, the drug and the device think tanks are going through lists of people and gathering outside consultants so that we will have um, both a clinical consultant, somebody who's an end user, give feedback, and also industry at a various, depending upon the level of the um, progress of the, of the project. So we are accumulating these lists and we have to have, you know, we don't want everybody to be there every day, time. We want to be able to have selected consultants from outside the academic areas come. So we had thought through that. So sorry, I didn't mention right. that. What, one other one other thought when we talk about the overall ecosystem is is trying to find the right balance of of you know th there's a there's a bit of a provincial nature to it. Um, you know, Cook a very <coughs> company, very committed to Indiana type company. But, you know, we can only, I mean, we only serve certain markets. We can only do so much. Um, and I think thinking more, getting Indiana to be more of a bit of a destination um, and thinking about, you know, there are other device companies that work in areas that, you know, could not even touch. Um, are they talking to Indiana? I know that when I'm out traveling and when I'm out moving across other ecosystems, Boston or San Diego or wherever, and you tell the Indiana story, um, it's a compelling story. Now, no doubt about it. We're an order of magnitude or more, you know, lower than some of these other places. Investments. We spun off a company a couple of years ago, um, Sex and Biotechnologies, and we had a five million dollar raise. In the quarter that we did it, it was the only life science raise and was the biggest one of the year for Indiana. Um, we were talking to some buddies in Boston, and uh, they actually had a geographic map there at Kendall Square. And within a quarter mile of this guy's office, there had been 474 deals in the same quarter in life sciences when we raised 5 million for, and we thought, you know, we thought we were, you know, doing pretty well. Now that raise that 5 million, um, only a portion of it, some of it came from Cook, some from Bio Crossroads, which was that great, that was great. But some of it came from the coast. One was from a big hedge fund in New York and we told the story and they said, that's compelling. They put money in and then a strategic off of the West Coast uh, also did the same thing. So. There, there. The, Neil was asking, you know, how do we get money? Capital in Indiana is a is an issue across all industry segments. Tech's got the same problem. Everybody's got the problem of how do we tell this story, but it is a compelling story when you frame it right and you can tell it. People will say, "I'm willing to bet on that." And so I think we've got a, a narrative issue, and a, we got to just sell ourselves a little better. But the Indiana story is a very positive story when you can tell it and frame it for people in sort of in the outside world. All right, I mean, I hate to cut off the discussion, but I do want to make sure we've got enough time for people to get a, a decent break and have some lunch before we get back in the afternoon. 
Uh, but I think that really helps set up the conversations and, and the discussion, some of the challenges, challenges we want to dive uh, really even more deeply into uh, this afternoon. So thanks, you know, Rob, Andy, Neil, uh, Sharon, George, great discussion. Uh, real quick, logistically, so we'll have about a, you know, about a 25 minute break now. Um, reconvene at, at uh, one o'clock. So to join one of the afternoon workshops, if you want to make sure, use the, the Zoom link in the email. So you're not going to automatically be sent to one of the breakouts. Um, I'll also put the link in the chat. It'll take you to the agenda. And then from there, you can connect out to, to any of the workshops you want. You can always change between them too. Um, and if you're in the pediatric session, you can just stay on this one because it's the same, the same link. And then just one last reminder at 2.30, please come back to this original Zoom meeting link uh, so we can call it, kind of share what we've learned, wrap up the day, uh, and hope to see you all in about 25 minutes. Thank you. <laughs>